So, welcome to the, the middle part of today, the keynote address. I hope you had a chance to stretch a bit and enjoy some lunch. Thank you for the great uh, presence and questions at this morning's sessions. Uh, the conference is off to a great start. I have the enormous pleasure uh, of introducing uh, a close friend and one of the great leaders both in legal education and the legal profession, Daniel Rodriguez. I'm going to start by an act of theft. I'm going to take a quote from one of Dan's own commencement law speeches. If he's using it in his talks today, he'll just have to reuse it, but it's so good, it's worth reusing. And why I loved it is I think it defines Dan. The quote was from the cultural theorist Paul Varillo, who wrote, the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. <laughs> Dan is both a shipbuilder and a shipwrecker. <laughs> Let me explain. He is currently uh, the Harold Washington Professor of Law at Northwestern, where he served as Dean from 2012 to 2018. Dan has spent time at both public and private institutions throughout the country, not just visits and lectures, but uh, uh, time as uh, Dean. He's a recidivist Dean, He's Dean at the University of San Diego. Uh, he was on the faculty at the University of California at Berkeley. He was on the faculty uh, as a Regents Chair at UT Austin. I was talking about public and private institutions. I put UT Austin somewhere between the two, maybe <laughs> heading more to the private side, but for what it's worth. Uh, Dan is widely recognized for his work in administrative law, local government law, statutory interpretation, and federal and state constitutional law. More recently, and actually for a while, He's had a significant interest and engaged on issues of the law, business, technology interface. And he has become widely recognized as a trailblazer, as a commentator, but also at times uh, an active and direct participant in legal innovation. In 2014, he was president of the American Association of Law Schools. He continues in a number of leadership roles where he can shape the conversation around these issues as a member of the uh, Council of the American Law Institute, the Governing Council of the American Bar Association, Center on Innovation, and as an advisor uh, to Ross uh, Intelligence, which is uh, dedicated to bringing AI to automate a legal process. Uh, one little illustration uh, of Dan's work as an innovator was as a dean at Northwestern, helping to create the masters in of law uh, dedicated or focused on STEM professionals to provide them a foundation in law. He may talk some about that uh, program today. Uh, th the last point I want to make is not only is Dan a leader, but he's a great co-conspirator. Uh, we live in a time when apparently conspiracies are the only ways that people work, and most of us <laughs> run away from claims that we're part of a conspiracy. I'd like to uh, embrace one here. Uh, for those of you who have followed innovations and developments at the College of Law here at Arizona Law, we've taken some risks and put ourselves out on uh, uh, taking on the LSAT, adding the GRE in as an alternate test, among, among other things. Uh, I have, in every case, found Dan not only to be a great counselor, uh, a, a thought advisor, someone who knows the landscape, a strategic thinker, but also someone who is time after time willing to step forward, to write, to write a letter, to participate, to, to, to make phone calls. And the willingness to step you know, into the breach, to take responsibility, to join uh, in, in, in some of these high-risk ventures. When you hold these distinguished positions at councils and as a dean of a, a major law school is, I think, quite distinctive. And it's, uh, it's not only a friendship, but a, a, a role I respect and have valued on an ongoing basis. So I can't tell you how pleased I was when Dan agreed to be the keynote speaker here. Dan agrees.
uh, the feeling is very much mutual, and at the risk, <coughs> feeling is very much mutual, at the risk of having. Is it something I said? Risk of having this turn in and descend into a mutual love fest. I want to uh, uh, say I appreciate the uh, the kudos, and I might change co-conspirator to co-enabler since I, I, I uh, suspect that Mark and I co-enable one another, which is why we're probably barred and banished from some of the finest legal uh, uh, legal education organizations in the land. But that's what we take as a point of pride. It's it's a it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be here in uh, Tucson, maybe more of a pleasure in January, February from Chicago than, uh, than now, but always a pleasure. And on a, is that, is that, oh, no, oh, any better? Okay. Someone's on their way, but that sounds great. Uh, and not just because it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here, it is, and, and, and certainly Mark uh, alluded to this, mentioned this in connection with in his remarks. Uh, I, I've long regarded, particularly in, in recent years and indeed in recent months, this law school to be a place of innovation, a place of creativity, a, a place of true leadership in a variety of ways. We we'll go on and on about those ways, and I won't, but given this is a conference on tech law, I'll say in particular on, uh, on the intersection of law and, and technology. And this, this event, and certainly what it presages, not presages is the wrong way to put it, because it sounds like it hasn't started yet. What it really builds on in terms of these fascinating, wonderful ventures and adventures that I've been learning about, look forward to learning about more uh, in the coming days, weeks, months, and years is something to be very proud of. And, and I feel a special kinship as a dean, uh, but also a special kinship as part of the law school at Northwestern that fancies itself, and I think is fairly uh, uh, regarded as also uh, exercising a leadership role in this, uh, in, in this area. Apologies to those of you who are here at the conference this morning and now and into the afternoon to talk mostly and learn mostly about technology. The focus of my remarks here is really about helping advance technology initiatives in legal education. So the focus will be on legal education. I have nothing to teach you, any of you, about autonomous vehicles, or about drones, or about blockchain, or about some of these others, although those are certainly names I will drop in the course, uh, in the course of, my, uh, of my remarks. I have expertise, if anything, in legal education, trying to build uh, 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 knowledge bases and also build initiatives in the areas of, of uh, law and technology, and want to reflect a bit in, in the time I have to talk about how we might think about doing that, and also some of the puzzles and perils that, uh, that are underway. So let me out on a brief technical note, technological note. Should I switch to the the ear? Yeah, and then we'll just kill that until okay, good. kill that. Well, kill was a little strong. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's a human making the decision. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to call him out except he came up to me before the thing. He says, I understand, uh, I've heard you have no content in your, in your remarks, right? <laughs> You have no digital contact, uh, 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 and so uh, yes, there are no, there are no uh, 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 slides. Right. Uh, finally, the substance. So the premise of the conference uh, and the ambition of the conference is that tech, tech law and technological innovation is especially valuable. In that respect, I hope and expect I'm preaching very much to the choir and the case for having more technology instruction in the law school classmate, we can stipulate, as we lawyers uh, like to say, uh, and instead what I want to talk about is some of the opportunities, challenges, and, uh, and strategies. So let me begin uh, with this. Tech, uh, tech law, what I used to call law tech, but given that this is a tech law conference, I'm going to have to switch out on that, is uh, when we're involved in that in the law school curriculum, we're involved in a deeply practical endeavor. So if we get from 10,000 feet up, we might say, uh, and here I'm speaking to those of you who've been in legal education for some time, oh, I get it. What this is is really a variation on the theme or version of experiential education. So what we're really looking to do is a somewhat more narrow redo, a 2.0 as it were, or a supplement to what we do with respect to exper experiential education. So bear with me when I say from that vantage point, much of the impetus behind talking about uh, implementing constructed, constructing strategy within the law schools 
is a sense of deja vu all over again, which is we are where we where experiential education, clinical education was roughly speaking in the maybe late 1970s into the 1980s. So we can take as our paradigm, really as our as our as our historical analogy how we went about in legal education as faculty members, as external stakeholders, and as deans, uh, fomenting the experiential revolution, uh, experiential education revolution, which to be fair is a work in progress, but has succeeded in extraordinary ways. So I want to suggest that that's a fair analogy, but it's an incomplete analogy in various ways. But let me start with where it's a fair uh, analogy. And to make a very long story very, very short, Experience in experiential uh, education goes back again roughly to the 1970s. It reaches its apogee in many respects in the late 1980s when the ABA decides uh, uh, with acknowledging that law schools have been done a pretty good job, they say they really need, we really need to put it on steroids. So the ABA puts famously, many of you know the story, a commission together in roughly the 1980s, a task force, uh, uh, as it were, on reform in uh, legal education, to be more, more precise, task force on law schools and the profession. And after a number of years in 1992, it issues a famous report called the McCrate Report, named after Robert McCrate, the former president of the ABA, uh, who is, is very much the, the impresario of that. And the McCrate Report, again, issued in 1992, if you can believe it now, nearly a quarter century uh, ago, begins by setting out a few conclusions, observations, based on a number of years of study about legal education, again, circa 1980s. There are two major limitations, says the McCrate Report, with legal education. First, most law schools give only casual attention to teaching students how to use legal thinking in the complexity of actual law practice. Unlike other professional education, most notably medical school, legal education typically pays relatively little attention to direct training in professional practice. And second, law schools fail to complement the focus on skills and legal analyses with effective support for developing ethical and social skills. The McCrate Report famously goes on to set out a, a template uh, by which they mention uh, up to 10 legal skills. I'll say them like a, uh, an auctioneer might. Problem solving, legal analysis and reasoning, legal research, factual investigation, communication, counseling, negotiation, litigation and ADR procedures, organization and management of legal work, and resolving and recognizing ethical dilemmas. And from that comes 150 pages, right, that talks about ways in which the law schools can and must, and must innovate and incorporate those skills so that every graduate of an ABA accredited law school uh, has no skills uh, uh, by the time they graduate. Again, in a small nutshell, the last quarter century since the McCrate Report has been, to put it mildly, a fertile time for experiential education. Growth of legal clinics, live client and simulations, well-organized externships, professional responsibility, not only the required course, but uh, also what Deborah Rohde famously called the use of the pervasive method throughout the curriculum, all of which suggests that experiential, uh, the experiential education revolution has been a meaningful and successful. In some sense, what, in one important sense, the marker of that success has been the ABA requirement now in the standards for the accreditation of law schools in 303A that requires six credits of experiential education by the time of graduation. Robert Dinnerstein, who, had, who enjoys the very uh, uh, unusual, but uh, uh, now not all that uncommon title at American University, it's not me, of, uh, of uh, <laughs> Associate Dean of Experiential Education, writes a couple of years ago, law schools are offering an ever-increasing array of classes, courses, programs, and experiences that provide students with the opportunity to learn and reflect upon legal skills, doctrine, ethics, and theory in the context of real and simulated legal work. So, to, the, to our point, does this history, this evolution, fit into the story of tech law education? Can we simply say, we're going to do, over the course of the next 25 years, what was done in the larger uh, paradigm and the larger structure of skills training? I'd suggest that the analogy is a strong one, and folks in legal education can and ought to credibly experience a sense of deja vu as we consider tech, tech law initiatives. Law schools should and many do aspire to the same, same uh, profile, the same acclaim, 
the same attention. I won't necessarily say the same ABA standards requirement. Here, Mark and I are, truly are partners in crime in preferring perhaps a less overbearing regulatory regime, but I digress. But in any event, maybe experiential education uh, in legal education is the template, the true model. Now, you can sort of see what, oh, and I should say one other point. And the sequence, the iteration, may be, may be profoundly analogous as well. Developing initiatives, clamor from the profession about the need for technology-related education. How on earth can a law school, you can hear the speeches, graduate responsible lawyers without having experience and exposure to technological innovations? honing and sharpening programs, and maybe just maybe getting to the point in which these requirement, these programs reflect requirements, not just preferences. <laughs> Finally, the point. I want to suggest the analogy is imperfect, and we take a page, but not too many pages, from the experience with experiential education in law schools. Indeed, I want to suggest that the analogies are strained in some important ways because, because of the unique and unusual nature and scope of tech law initiatives. Something about technology and law and law and technology that is fundamentally different in important ways and follows a different logic than experiential education and the litany of skills training uh, 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 standards mentioned before. And I want to suggest four reasons for why that is so. First, tech law, I want to suggest, doesn't aspire to just supplement foundational core legal education and legal subjects. It has the promise, or if you prefer, runs the risk of reconfiguring those legal subjects in some important ways. Certainly want to uh, uh, harken back to half an hour ago and an hour ago in the conversations that we've had and have yet to come about the various ways in which technology can reconfigure additional legal subjects. And some would, uh, uh, myself included, would take a step farther than that and say that in some respects, tech law effaces legal subjects, replaces them altogether. And so we might be looking over time at a different core, at a different set of foundational legal knowledge, not just about skills, but about the knowledge it, uh, it, it, uh, it itself. And, and, and you can choose your poison, or whatever the opposite of poison is, your, your nectar. Uh, uh, in order to reflect uh, this uh, point. Uh, some impactful and interesting technology initiatives stretch and probe the boundaries, indeed, between what is law and what is non-law. So take the debate about the impact of blockchain, not so much in the context of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, which of course uh, is where we find its origins, but also in the develop blockchain, you might say 2.0, the use of blockchain to develop so-called smart contracts. So from the one hand, maybe seen as not effacing contract law, but just providing another window into how we think about contracting, automating legal information, as it were. But in the minds and the heads of some, the operationalizing of blockchain might actually remove disputes over the meaning of contracts, put them, as it were, on autopilot, so that blockchain and, and, and the development of smart contracts can be seen as a legal innovation one in which a legal form, a contract, is adapted to new technology, or indeed as a means of taking a business device out of the realm of law. So law students will be interested in contracting, but capital C contract, capital L contract law might mean something different altogether. Or here's an example from copyright. Fascinating project that some of you may, uh, may have heard about out of Holland, out of the Netherlands called the Next Rembrandt. Anybody yet heard, hear of that? This was an experiment about three years ago in which artists uh, and computer scientists in, in Holland decided to basically uh, develop, in essence, the Next Rembrandt. Not a, not, a, not a portrait that just looks a lot like one, but one that could be seen as nearly identical in the design as something that Rembrandt, were he to come to life, would paint today. And by all the measures that would fool other artists, that would develop uh, 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 some, some uh, salience that indeed would be valuable in a, in a special sort of way. And they did that. And indeed the next Rembrandt project, which you can Google and look up uh, and find, uh, is really fascinating. The interesting question is what it does to copyright law. Is it an invention and an innovation from a human, or is it an invention or an innovation from a, a machine? There's another project called, I love this title, Bot Dylan. And Bot Dylan is a, is a mechanism to, kind of a, to, to, to crowdsource, as it were, and use, and, and use AI machine learning technology to generate songs that are not copies of Bob Dylan.
but are copies of Irish folk songs and sort of expand the scope of these. You'll have other examples, but the point is that's another instance of ways in which the use of technology, and in particular the use of AI and machine learning, might change foundational legal subjects. So that's one difference between that and the experiential education movement. Here's a second. Technology or tech law initiatives are intrinsically collaborative. Now, I don't want to exaggerate the point to say that all uh, devotees of experiential education, devotees of the great report revolution, think that law is entirely a silo. Okay, that ship is safe. Law is interdisciplinary in a fundamental, foundational way. Was in 1992, remains so in 2018. But let's be clear. The gist and the genesis of experiential, experiential education in the law curriculum was we need to train students to think like lawyers. And thinking like a lawyer, thinking like a lawyer means developing and applying practical legal skills. That's what lawyers do. The implication is that's what folks who are not lawyers don't do. And so we need to be more, if not insular, more self-focused uh, uh, in, in the lawyer business. We can't afford to be that in the law and technology world. And I hope this goes almost without saying that I'm preaching the choir. The very notion of technology and the utilization of skills and foundational knowledge from outside the four corners of not only legal education, but law altogether is fundamental. We heard about that again in the panel, the, 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 the quick and rapid agreement in the panel about how engineers need to learn more about law and vice versa. All the initiatives worth their salt, whether it's in Arizona, Northwestern, ASU, any of the any of the institutions that are represented here, BYU, there's a, they are, I'm gonna miss some. <laughs> they they uh, they involve, right, a conflate, not only not a conflation, but a conspiracy and collaboration among our colleagues throughout the universities. And that suggests that the work that we do in law schools, if we just do it with a focus on law schools, will be too thin, too anemic, too uh, uh, insufficiently interdisciplinary. So the focus and the focal point about experiential education in the law tech world is to take these initiatives outside the four corners and the parameters of just law and just traditional legal education and build on insights from our colleagues. And let's be clear, though, about the other side of that coin. It's not just that we in law schools and legal educators need the kindness of friends and the, and the knowledge base that comes from other units and departments within the university. I want to say with equal verb that our colleagues in other departments of the university, where they are operating and working, be it in computer science, in engineering, in, uh, in business, and indeed even in many aspects of the humanities, require and need exposure to legal education, to the fundamentals of law. The wonderful initiative underway here, the BA in Law Initiative, I'm sure, I'm sure has deeply embedded it. The, the principle, the commitment to the idea that law is not just for lawyers anymore. And the, and the project has to be to integrate in important ways legal information. But, 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 but I don't want to meander from the general point. A second way in which the analogy breaks down between experiential education and law and technology education is tech law is intrinsically collaborative. Third, uh, legal ethics. The movement in experiential education, the salutary movement, right, to teach more legal ethics and to embed legal ethics throughout the curriculum in law is about the unique role of legal ethics and ethical responsibilities that lawyers have and lawyers have faced. It's a different topic for a different day, I'll, I'll grant you. But I can't resist pointing out that some of that narrowness in terms of legal ethics are about law has been one of the linchpins of the effort to resist non-lawyers from interfering and engaging in the practice of law, right? Legal ethics, only lawyers understand legal ethics. Folks at, at, at Deloitte don't have responsibilities to engage in legal ethics. Uh, I, uh, AI uh, and machine learning technologists uh, must be limited because they won't have a, 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 the kind of fidelity and experience in legal ethics has been used to maintain the guilt. But whether you like it or don't like it, you can tell what I think. Nonetheless, the point is that uh, a professional responsibility experiential education has been focusing on legal ethics. I want to suggest that we simply can't afford to do that in the area of tech law. The ethical issues with regard to technology expand quickly and significantly beyond legal ethics, and that's exactly how it should be. The debate over what lawyers should do with technology should give and is giving way to a richer debate about social ethics and morality in this world of dynamic new technology where lawyers might have and indeed should have broader duties 
they can be captured by just simply the rules of ethics that are professional ethics. And fourth and finally, tech law punches, and I alluded to that in my comments just a moment ago, tech law punches holes in the wall dividing lawyers and those who are not lawyers. The resist, I say those who are not lawyers. Non-lawyers is a terrible phrase. The only problem is none of us have come up with a better <laughs> phrase. So we don't hear about non-doctors and non-bakers as a category. But, 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 but so, so permit me to use non-lawyers just among us friends. It punches uh, uh, holes in the wall dividing lawyers and non-lawyers. The resistance to a radically different approach to the provision of legal services, and to be more precise, who provides those services may be futile. Footnote, I think it will be futile. Given the availability of technology to solve client problems, the greater democratization of law and legal information, and the brute fact of our access to justice uh, crisis. So, so that's one point I wanted to make in this, is that experiential education a, a, a analogy is interesting and important, but it shouldn't be exaggerated, and there's really a different logic at work. I want to turn uh, for a few minutes to, uh, to another category, another approach, again, under the rubric of how we think about tech law in the context of legal education. I want to su suggest something that's probably hopelessly ambitious. So as all the holes and the flaws of something that is hopelessly ambitious, but please bear with me. I want to take a couple minutes to disaggregate or decompose the different elements of what we call and might call tech law education. This is, to be sure, not an effort to be comprehensive about all the different elements or to show off about, oh, here's some stuff I know about technology. Uh, that's fruitless. But just to give you this sense of how we might set out learning objectives in this realm. So if someone says, I want the elevator speech, now this would probably be a long elevator, but I want the elevator speech about what it means to say we should be doing more about technology in legal education. I sort of want to know what that means other than we should have more classrooms uh, wired up best to be able to teach through the use of technology, which then we certainly mean something broader than that, right? So I want to suggest that there are, uh, when we di di disaggregate them, we should sort of put them in four buckets. It's a homely metaphor, but let's think about buckets, four different buckets. And I'll, and I'll say, and I'll, and I'll go through this uh, uh, briefly. Number one, the first bucket, new structures. By new structures, I mean ways in which technology can help us in concrete and coherent ways to structure things that we've been hoping and in fact structuring for decades. This is not new about technology. It's about categories that we think are central for our law students to understand. And technology gives us new windows into how we structure these categories. Here are my big four. Data, what it looks like, how we use it. Before there was big data, there was data. Probably always was big data, it was just a guy to be older. So how technology helps us organize that data, enormously important. <coughs> Second, related but not the same, legal information. How we find it, how we utilize it, how we retrieve it. So the body of legal information, beginning maybe beginning with cases, but including statutes, regulations, all, everything that counts as legal information. Third, the performance of institutions. How we measure the performance of courts, administrative bureaucracies, legislatures, individual judges. How we compare and contrast them. How we measure them against institutions that they operate in other countries under the rubric of comparative law. We're in the business of institutional analysis in law schools. We always have been. In, in a fundamental form or a fashion, and how we go about and analyze the performance of legal institutions, and I would add legal and political institutions, is, front and, uh, uh, is, 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 is at the front of our core, and technology helps us in, that, in many different ways, and regulation, something near and dear to my heart. You will add things to that list, and even if you think it is a too thin list, I hope you'll agree that new structures is one important bucket in which we put technology. Second bucket, analytic methods, some of the most fascinating, fascinating use of technology. That is to say, technology helps us look at similar phenomena in fundamentally different ways. AI and machine learning, probably at the top of that list, but if not at the top of the list, on that list. Artificial intelligence and machine learning as new analytic methods. Design thinking. Design thinking doesn't get invented with technology, but goes hand in glove with technology. And if, there, if technology added absolutely nothing to enrich the law school curriculum, nothing else, it would have been enormously important by focusing like a laser beam 
our attention in the law school context, and indeed I would suggest in the higher education context, on particular methods of thinking about solving society's wicked problems. And design thinking is enormously important and impactful in doing that in a variety of ways. Uh, and the third, I would say, is computational legal science. A little more space agey, but there's a, there's, a, there's a body of folks, group of folks, a variety of schools who are merging and melding legal analysis of a traditional form and, uh, and uh, computer science, particularly with the availability of high computational po uh, uh, power, but also sophisticated modeling, some of which is drawn from social science, science modeling that will fam be familiar to those of you who've been involved in social science, all as a way of developing a, uh, a new field. For reasons I have no way to fathom, but some of you might help me, this has become enormously important in, of all places, Italy. It, uh, Italy is now the hotbed of computational legal science. Most of the papers coming out of that. You tell me. Maybe it's the one. But whatever, but whatever it is, that's not my main point. Suffice to say that those kinds of analytic methods, design thinking, uh, uh, AI machine learning, some of you might want to quibble and say blockchain should fall in that category, computational legal science. That's the second bucket. Let me go through the third and the fourth. Third, applications to myriad legal subjects. This is just this sort of Cook's tour through the various ways in, in which legal subjects are becoming illuminated through the use of technology. You will have your own list. I have my top ten list in no particular order, IP, cybersecurity, privacy, biotech and biomed innovations. It hasn't come up today, and I'm not sure there's a panel on it in the afternoon, but one of the most fascinating developments is the rise of CRISPR and gene altering. It represents a myriad, a myriad of fascinating, difficult legal, uh, legal, uh, uh, legal uh, uh, questions, controversies that involve various different categories. Digital reproduction of 3D printing. Remember the case long, as long ago as two months ago involving 3D printing of guns? Enormous legal issues that, that come with uh, 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 matters of digital reproduction. Liability law, autom autonomous, uh, autonomous vehicles that were mentioned today. Negotiation and alternative dispute resolution, ODR, the use of technology for that. Consumer protection, scoring, how we evaluate the, the various ways in which scoring technology is available. Criminal law, criminal justice, are we at, back at an age you remember the Minority Report film, right? Space AG, a number of years ago, the Tom Cruise movie, where you could predict people, uh, possibility of committing crime and arrest them. That may be not that far off, given the availability of technology. Antitrust, uh, contracts. Again, you, you might have a list of 30, that's just 10 quick ones. And, I'll, and I'll, let me mention the last button. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get through this quickly because I want to get to the last point. But just to summarize, there, there, there's uh, 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 new structures, analytic methods, applications to myriad legal subjects. Finally, we circle all the way back to our, where we began with experiential education. Technology and the new skills training. Here's what's on my list of basic practice proficiencies or competencies that I would want all of our law students to have some exposure to before they graduate from law school. Predictive analytics. Not complete overlap with AI and machine learning, although that's a big part of it. But having students understand predictive analytics, it gives them an enormous window not only into a practical set of skills, but it raises a number of fascinating issues, like algorithmic bias, understanding how to not only how to compose an algorithm and think about it. That, to me, is far more important than taking a class in coding, by the way, if I may. I think that ship has sailed. Take a class in Python, knock yourselves out. But if you really want some exposure to technology, take a class in predictive analytics and understand the, the, uh, the opportunities and the challenges presented by algorithms in, in modern society. Design thinking I mentioned before, and in particular, Design thinking's application to access to justice considerations. I know we'll talk about that this afternoon. My, my temporary colleagues, I'm visiting Stanford this semester, Margaret Hagen has a design lab at Stanford. Fascinating uh, window into that. I, I'm aware of BYU and Arizona uh, 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 collaborating on a number of ventures, and many other schools as well are using design thinking, technology, the building of apps to, uh, to, help, uh, to help challenge the access to justice crisis. How to use chatbots. It's a narrow technology, but chatbots have revolutionized chatbots have revolutionized in some fairly important ways. So-called legal checkups and legal counsel, using analogies from uh, from uh, from medicine, uh, regulatory science, which I understand is well underway here. Again, the category, the, the the examples are less important than the bucket, and the bucket is basically how we use technology to uh, establish uh, 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 requirements for uh, skills training. I want to make one last point and then, and then make sure uh, I, I keep the trains running on time and leave a few minutes to question. 
The hardest thing I leave to the last. What should schools do? What does the blueprint look like? Not a comprehensive list. I want to mention, just tick off a few suggestions in that regard with caveats or buts, because I want to give the challenges part. I don't want you to leave this room filled with optimism. I want you to leave this room with a decent dose of consternation, if not pessimism. Okay? <laughs> Curricular infusion. So I'll do this, I'll do this, I'm not going to dramatic one. Should infuse the curriculum in a variety of different ways with technology. Here comes the but. It's a challenge about whether we should be doing that through the development of boutique courses that we beg, sorry, urge our students to take? <laughs> or should we think about it with respect to the pervasive method? That is an existential challenge about the law school curriculum, and it's tempting to say, well, you do both. But it's very hard to do both. So that yin and the yang of boutique courses, so a few students take legal uh, technology, or the pervasive method is a key challenge. Second, institutional leadership. How can I be about that? Jesus, I gave the best years of my life to dean at two great law schools. Uh, but, Deans can be overbearing. Sometimes the initiatives don't last, outlast the leadership of a particular school at a, at a moment in time. That could be true of deans, it could be true of provosts and presidents. How do we make these innovations stick? How do you measure faculty buy-in? So institutional leadership is critical, but it comes with challenges. Third, the faculty. The faculty, the brave new world of integrating the faculty in these technology uh, initiatives. But, it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks. I'm looking ahead, I'm not looking ahead. It's hard to teach old dogs new tricks. There are limited resources for faculty hiring. Much of the scholarship in law tech is unconventional, and folks are urged to get to that once they're past tenure. Because how can a world in which very few of us have expertise in tech law evaluate scholars who are doing work in tech law? And it's a tale of two statuses. And, and, and why should we replicate the experiential education story of basically just parking folks without, without substantial faculty status in our environment to be the ones teaching law tech. So the faculty issue uh, presents some challenges. Marketing and external impact, a wonderful opportunity for schools to leverage what they're doing in order to market to the world, external stakeholders in the world, all the great th things they're doing. One of my colleagues at Stanford said, this is the butt part, said it's great, but you have a problem of legacy labeling. He says, we have a center at Stanford called the Center for E-Commerce. What the hell are we going to do about that? <laughs> That's like saying we have a center on the World Wide Web. <laughs> you know, so you have to worry. that you, you better hope that your center and you brand it is a way that will be really important a few years from now. Be careful of those centers on blockchain. <laughs> because the, label, the legacy labeling might present some problems. I, I, I have a, just a, a few more. Collaboration. Just, I just sang the praises of collaboration. Who could be against collaboration? But, but, is law on a big university, research university, is just the tail rather than the dog? Is it something to give our computer science copy, uh, 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 colleagues a hobby? Uh, how do we make sure that law is central to that collaboration? How do we ins ensure that, uh, that uh, the resources can be, uh, can be uh, combined in, in fruitful ways? Uh, uh, F and G, my last two. Two sides of the law tech coin, we should be doing it all. We should talk about how the law impacts on technology and technology impacts the law. But that could be a head scratcher too. Let's say you had a course on AI. Now I've looked at the syllabi of most courses in AI in the United States and it's really interesting. They split down the middle. Half of them are about essentially AI of law. Okay, how artificial intelligence affects the law in powerful ways. The other half are about the law of AI. So you have to have some agreement about what you're doing with respect to the integration of law and technology. And I'm not saying the line is a, is a clear line, but we haven't figured that out yet. And last but not least, and here's sort of where I'll end, pervasive uncertainty. It's not unrelated to the point I made about legacy label. Pervasive uncertainty. Technology changes so damn fast. If we have a course in property and we maintain it in the curriculum, it can survive as it has for 150 years because the, the, the fundamental elements of it, the fundamental elements of it are sort of there. I'm not saying they never change, but, uh, but you know, the, the, the basic, what's the Latin I'm searching for about uh, numerous clauses principle, right, which we learned in 1890 can apply today because we have the same sort of forms. So we can say that about a lot of legal subjects. How on earth can we say that about technology? Technology is so, is changing so rapidly. Education, not just legal education, education changes so slow that there really is a puzzle about how 
we're going to be all in. How many chips we're going to put in the middle of the table in the face of a world that is changing so rapidly and the face of pervasive uncertainty. I think we can all agree, certainly everyone in this room can agree, the solution is not to stay on the sidelines until it all gets sorted out. But there is a case to be made for a middle ground. There is a case to be made for not having all of our law schools start a center on blockchain, start a center on AI and machine learning, start a center on smart contracts, start a center on computational law, because it may just be a little bit, start a center even on autonomous vehicles, because it might take a little time to sort out what exactly are going to be the big hit, big wins. And it's figuring out how to, how to basically put resources in, uh, in, in uh, innovative initiatives in the face of per pervasive uncertainty that is there. Now, I was sort of kidding when I said I want you to leave here with uh, pessimism. I don't want anyone to leave with pessimism. I just want folks to leave with a sense there's a lot still to figure out. And all we're really embracing is a, uh, a much more profound concentration and attention on issues of law and business and technology. And that is something well worth embracing. But the strategy that, uh, that unfurls from that embrace will take months and years to figure out. And no law school, even a terrific, innovative law school like Arizona or Northwestern, is going to figure that out on its own. It's going to have to be a collective conversation. And I say this particularly to those, and I'll end on this, particularly those of you in the room who are not professional legal educators, who are here uh, 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 lending your expertise uh, about this, we need you. We always say that about the teaching of the law, but we desperately need you to keep us on the right pathway, to not only to teach us about the technology, but to give us the opportunities, the opportunities uh, to, uh, to, uh, to not get it wrong, and to fail where we fail, but to have the experiments that will really pursue those initiatives, uh, initiatives uh, uh, very well. So thank you very much. It's really been a great pleasure. And I, if there is uh, just a few minutes, I know we need to move on to another panel in a little bit. But with the dean's permission, yeah. I'd be happy to take any any uh, any, uh, any questions. Yes, sir. Here. Uh, so it, it's you hit the nail on the head about how hard it is to innovate within law schools. Uh, law schools are really faculty governed, and most of our faculty colleagues are, like Daniel and I were talking this morning, constitutional law, criminal law. They don't like any of this stuff. Um, what do you think of a model of creating, like someone suggested MIT create a law school, of a technology-based law school, that's all, that's all they do, and they train students who would come out to practice technology law. Do you think that would be an alternative model? Well, I, 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 I mean, more power to them uh, 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 to do such an initiative like that. I think that would be very interesting. When uh, you know Dan Katz goes around the country with his uh, very large slide deck and has one of his slide decks is MIT's law school, what he really means is, well, MIT gobbling up Suffolk and that becomes law school, whatever. So the devil's off in the details. But let's let's blue sky think. If if uh, if you know a really tremendously innovative Carnegie Mellon or if MIT, uh, uh, Caltech really started, we would learn an enormous amount from that. The sad reality is, put aside the slow moving direction of law schools and faculty governance. We have the, you know, the enormous umbrella of the ABA accreditation process, U.S. News and World Report, who employers hire, and all of that, which creates a set of obstacles and incentives for a law school basically going all in and saying we're going to actually do that. I, I would make this brief comment where you actually, there might be a middle ground, which is not so much a someone going out like an MIT and creating a new law school, but creating a something well beyond a center and short of a comprehensive three-year JD degree something that has a degree and a credentialing and, and, and all that function, maybe it would even be virtual in some sense, that is really about teaching and ex, uh, educating new generations of legal professionals, including but not limited to practicing lawyers in this, in this particular space. That would be a really interesting, uh, interesting model. I, I should say, we're here in America, good old USA, making it great again. But there are some uh, really interesting initiatives, uh, innovations along the way that are happening in Europe, you may, as you may know, and other parts of the world that really are this middle ground between the traditional encumbrances of educational institutions and, and more kind of research centers. Yeah. Thank you very much for the uh, discussion. I, I'm a technologist, I'm not a lawyer or a law student. Um, and I wonder if you don't actually have um, a, a bit of a Frankenstein raw materials model. So the the law school is has a, an exit of uh, being admitted to the bar, and you have you know standards that are keep raising um, to be able to be degreed and credentialed. Whereas as technologists, we 
we almost pride ourselves on having no standard. There is no digital bar to be admitted to. Some of the richest technologists in the world actually dropped out of education facilities. How do you square those two together so that you don't end up having um, technology be a second language applied to someone who was predisposed to be an, a lawyer as opposed to a technologist who happens to uh, become a lawyer? Great question, something I think about a lot. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that in the long run, you can't square it. I think that some of the initiatives underway in a number of our institutions, mine and others, to educate uh, uh, non-lawyers into, into law and bring them into to, to a greater exposure to, uh, to, to law and all of that is in some sense sowing the seeds of our guild destruction, and that's a great thing. Not destruction of lawyers, not destruction of the legal system but are, are breaking down those silos, which you quite accurately know, between on the one hand, technologists, which by their very nature can, can be entrepreneurial, right, because they don't need the guild and the credentials in order to aspire. The market tells them whether they succeed or not. We have, as we do in medicine, a built-in guild. You cannot practice law without a license, and a license means something quite specific. Oh, and by the way, quite a long time to gain. Oh, and by the way, very expensive. And so I think there will have to be a destabilization over time of that regime. It will start by having folks who are in the way that's starting now with having folks, technologists and others, learning more about law and having that reciprocal relationship and conversation. It will continue through a widening of access to what used to be the traditional practice of the law, to the provision of legal services through a variety of ways that are practiced by folks who have not gone through the JD route. That's happening, that already happening, triple LTs and watch There's many stories of that. Where it will end, in my view, and I don't know when, is the de siloing of professional education and the understanding that it is really, I mean, it, Kurzweil talked about singularity being near. Of course, that was 13 years ago, so I guess not all that near. I think the singularity that I'm interested in, it's more of a form of consilience, is that there'll actually be collaboration among professional disciplines. And so when you, you, 10 years from now, or 15 years from now, you won't say, I'm a technologist, not a lawyer. You'll give a longer uh, 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 explanation of how you're involved in the law. And the fact that you can't necessarily go up and represent Mark Miller in, co in court for a traffic violation he's committed is sort of beside the point, because that won't be necessary. You won't need three years of legal education in order to, in order to pursue what you're, uh, what you're actually doing. So uh, you you almost answered my question in that last uh, you know two minutes of what you just did to answer her question. But I, I know you've innovated a lot with legal education and education of law. Those two things being different ideas. Yep. Um, and you know my dean Gordon Smith has talked with you about this and is trying to move in that direction yep. as well. H how do you I mean do you do you see the three year JD? as being something that we do need to fight to maintain amidst all of this? I mean, you know, a master of laws, uh, all these other things where we might be teaching law and all these other disciplines. Is the three-year JD still something we should fight to hang on to because it will serve a purpose? Or Here's what I think is worth fighting. I think what's worth fighting over, and here, uh, and here I think that there's, there's a, a lot that's good to come, come of the American model of legal education. Because as we all know, the three-year JD model is intrinsically American, right? is what's worth fighting over is comprehensive, high-level legal education that includes foundational uh, knowledge. We can, we can quarrel and should quarrel about what foundational means. Experiential, experiential education and, and also interdisciplinary work, multidisciplinary work. I think that takes, uh, with all due respect to undergraduate legal education, which is, which is so true in so many parts of the world, I think it requires something more than just a major in law in, uh, in, in, in the undergraduate level, although I see that as valuable. But what it exactly means in terms of postgraduate, that is post-secondary education, to me is very much up in the air. So no, I don't think we need to defend to the nail the JD model as a special professional credential that is three years of additional work. I think there are other ways of imagining a very different set of uh, edu uh, educational paradigm. I'm not even sure that it requires an undergraduate degree from an America, an accredited American college university in order to go down that route. And lastly, like New York and some other experiments, I don't think you need a JD to be able to take a bar examination. But with all those caveats, I do think there's a role for substantial uh, uh, augmented education beyond what you, the core of the liberal arts one. And I also think there's a role in the accreditation organization. I don't know if it has to be the ABA or the Department of Education 
or any other one entity, but I think the quality control that we have to be able to distinguish between somebody, you know, uh, uh, around the corner basically saying, I'm opening up a law school, and you should come here and basically do that. I, I believe in the model of consumer protection. It's just how we figure out that consumer protection should, uh, should be debated. Last point I would make is, let's have a natural experiment. Uh, the ABA should tomorrow get rid of its requirement of three-year JD program. Of course, the states are free to do that now, right? Any state can basically say, we don't, you don't have to go to an ABA accredited law school to practice law. And then let's see some law schools uh, pop up. To Gary's point, maybe the MIT law school will pop up and say, actually, we're going to train folks to, you know, to they can pass a bar exam along the way. We'll see if they're spectacular failures. Then all the all the traditionalists will say, should have kept the three-year law degree. That was that was uh, that was a pretty good uh, pretty good model. Question? Yep. I'm a little confused about something. I mean, there's certain things that I'm hearing that. I would agree with. There is a lot of baked in traditional extraneous requirements baked into the practice of law. But just to give you a sense of like my trajectory, I was a technologist and I was upset about the state of the law, so I went to law school so I could do something about it. Um, now that I'm a practitioner, I couldn't be the practitioner I am if I didn't have a robust foundation in the things that we teach in law school. Um, and I went to law school focused on technology law, looking for an environment where I'd be able to think it and live it as much as possible, because that was the thing that was fascinating to me. Um, but that's not the things that I necessarily take with me into my practice. The things that make me effective as a practitioner, as a policy advocate, are civ pro, contracts, con law, the writing I had to learn to do when I was in law school. So I'm all for finding efficiencies in how we deal with training up lawyers, and I'm also all for making sure that the lay public is also more fluent in law generally. If we're a democracy, people should understand how it works, and I really would encourage open doors between lawyers and lay people. But I'm a little troubled that it seems like we might be knocking down a little bit too much, um, and that there is a lot more value in some of the things that make lawyers special and then some of those extra encumbrances actually do have some value to them that do make us distinctive in the community. You know, I, I, there's nothing in what you said that I disagree. And, and, and to the extent that I, that I uh, was heard to throwing out the baby with the bathwater, let me clarify uh, what I mean. And it actually builds on the, question, the, the response to the question. Uh, let me take my program, let's bring it close to home, or our program at Northwestern. We have a program, Master of Science and Law program for STEM professionals who come in. They can't, of course, be trained and pass the bar. It's a one-year full-time program, uh, in, in full-time model. We don't purport or pretend that they will have the rich array of skill set to enable them to represent clients. And not just because the ABA doesn't let them represent clients, but to your point, they don't have, and that's the program is not built to provide them with all of the panoply of foundational knowledge that enables folks to draw from that experience and go and do what you do. So uh, just a hypothetical student who comes to us, comes to the program and says, you know, I'm here's Northwestern and here's all the other world of law schools. Uh, will this do what I need to do in terms of my ambitions? For many of those prospective students, the answer is absolutely no. What will give you the equipment to be able to prosper is to go to law school in a much more substantial way, to take all the courses that you described. Uh, uh, hopefully those, those courses will become more infused with technology, and they'll be updated in the ways that we can agree they should be. But the foundational core of law school is something about which we should be very proud of. When I suggested the breaking down of the guilds, I meant, or our guild, in some sense that's to address a narrow point, which is how we think about folks who can provide legal services in a broad sense. But I wouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater and suggest that we should abandon the, the, the extraordinary kind of legal education that here, I'm gonna use this phrase, is the envy of the world in terms of the opportunities that it presents to provide a more comprehensive, fulsome amount of legal education. I just retreat to the point, whether that has to be three years, whether that has to be 180 grand, whether that has to be you know uh, uh, all residential and precious little online, those are really important larger questions. But I don't think there's a lot of daylight between what you would describe in terms of what you got out of law school and how it uh, enabled you to prosper, and what I got out of law school and how it enabled me to prosper in not only legal education but thinking about thinking about the practice uh, practice of, of, of learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Please join me in thanking Dan Rodriguez.